I'm Justin Bilby and I'm the Executive Dean of the Faculty of Health Sciences at the University of Adelaide and the President of the Florian Medical Research Foundation. Fantastic to see so many people here tonight in this magnificent hall. I'd like to first acknowledge the, that we're meeting on the traditional lands of the Ghana people of the Adelaide Plains, the land on which the University of Adelaide is built. We recognise and respect their cultural heritage, beliefs and relationships with the land and we acknowledge that these lands are of continuing importance to the Ghana people living today. As I said, on behalf of the University of Adelaide and the Florey Medical Research Foundation, I'd like to welcome you all here tonight. I'd like to welcome Frances Bedford, the member for Florey. It's great to see her turning up to all the events regarding the Florey Medical Research Foundation. The Florey Lecture is an annual event hosted by, hosted by the Florey Medical Research Foundation. The foundation is named in honour of the Nobel Laureate Howard Florey, a 1921 medical graduate whose role in the development of penicillin has saved an estimated 80 million lives. His lifetime of achievement serves as an important source for our inspiration for our students and researchers alike. In honour of this great man, the Florida Medical Research Foundation is committed to funding research projects of the highest calibre. And the Foundation's goal is to continue to raise funds to appoint early career postdoctoral research fellowships. As at last year's lectures, I was proud to announce the appointment of our first respected research fellow, Dr. Anit Asai Kumar. Since that time and through a significant request to the Foundation, a further two research fellows have been awarded three-year fellowships in the field of clinical cancer research by Kathleen Pissas and Dr. Jackie Knoll. Kathleen is based at the Centre for Cancer for Personalised Cancer Medicine, where we are trying to find a cure for sarcoma, and Jackie is based at the Myeloma Research Laboratory in the School of Medical Sciences, where she's trying to look at a cure for multiple myeloma. Further to this, and in conjunction and very important with Art of Arthritis SA, we've been able to fund a further fellowship to Dr. Elizabeth Thune for three years to gain a better understanding of the barriers for people with musculoskeletal conditions and such as arthritis and osteoporosis. The Flora Medical Research Foundation hopes to appoint its fifth fellowship in 2014. This is a tangible benefit and the generosity of many individuals, community groups, uh, looking to find solutions to some of the problems we have to deal with. So as a donors and supporters, thank you very much. But now, more importantly, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Professor Ian Fraser. I thank you, I need to thank Ian for coming down to deliver the Flory Lecture. And, and I look forward to hearing your, your conversation today about controlling cancer through immunotherapy, lessons from the papillomavirus associated cancers. Before I welcome him, I'd like to share some of his outstanding and impressive achievements. Internationally renowned for co-creation of the technology for the cervical cancer vaccines, Professor Fraser began his career as a renal physician and clinical immunologist in, in Edinburgh, Scotland, before immigrating in 1981 to Melbourne, Australia. He teamed his clinical training and pursued studies in viral immunology and autoimmunity at the Walter and Eliza Institute of Medical Research with Professor Ian McKay. In 1985, Professor Fraser accepted a teaching post for the University of Queensland, was appointed director of the University of Queensland's Diamantina Institute in 1991. In, in early 2011, Professor Fraser relinquished directorship of that institute to commence and post as the CEO of the Translational Research Institute, which in some ways is guiding the development around translational research in Australia. He retains an active research program in the Institute in, in the Immune Responses to Cancer and Cancer in Immunotherapy. Professor Fraser was awarded the 2005 Syro Eureka, Eureka Prize for Leadership in Science and was selected as Queensland of the Year and Australian of the Year in 2006. He was awarded the 2008 Prime Minister Science Prize for Science, 2009 Honda Prize and in 2011 was elected to the, as a Fellow to the esteemed Royal Society in London. In 2012, Professor Fraser was appointed as the Companion of the Order of Australia in the Queen's Birthday List Honours and as well as an, as an Australian National Living Treasure in the same year. In, the, pro, pro, Professor Fraser, as he heads his, his Translational Research Institute, leads an expert group of about 650 researchers from four leading medical institutes. As an Australian first, the Institute represents the future of biomedical research in Australia. 
quite simply, the Institute's bench to bedside capability means research, clinical trials, and the manufacture of breakthrough treatment and therapies for common and chronic illnesses occurs in a single location. It's really about the vision, and we are indeed privileged to have Professor Fraser Dent addressing us today. So thank you, Ian. I'll leave you to the presentation. Thanks very much. Thank you, Professor Bilby, and th thank you all for coming along to listen this evening. Uh, it's a great honour to be invited to give a, a lecture in the name of someone who has contributed so much to the welfare of mankind. I think that uh, we underestimate in Australia our capacity to do good quality medical research and deliver world-class outcomes, and I think it's important that we continue to honour those who in the past have done a really good job, and Howard Florey certainly came into that category. I think without him we would all be much worse off. What I'm going to do for you today is to talk a little bit about how we currently understand the body's defences against infection to control cancer. There's a lot learned in that area over the last few years and it's a global challenge to make use of that information. The Translational Research Institute that I work in is focused on that challenge of making sure that the science that we do is actually turned into something of benefit to humankind. The picture that you see on the screen there is the artist's impression of what the building was going to look like. You can tell it's an artist's impression because those trees in the foreground are Woolmai, Woolmai pines, these fossil trees that were found in New South Wales, and they will take 350 years to grow that tall. <laughs> uh, but actually, if you take the picture from the right angle, you can actually get it to look pretty much like that because that's not an artist's impression. That is a photograph of the building as it now is. And if you take it from ground level, you can make the trees look quite tall. Uh, it brings together, as was said, some researchers from four different research institutes. But the critical thing from our point of view is that we're focused on getting the basic science turned into practical outcomes. And then within the building, we have the capacity to make the treatments that arise from those to a standard that they can be used in the adjacent hospital as first-line treatments for patients in early clinical trials. And indeed, in principle, we could go all the way through to manufacturing for market in the facility. This isn't a facility for TRI. It's a facility for Australia. In other words, for the researchers all around the country. And that's the reason why I suspect the government felt inclined to fund it back in 2004. What I'm going to do now is to start with a general overview of where I see some challenges lying for health in the future and then focus down on cancer and cancer immunotherapy. Our big challenge as we all sit here in the room today is healthy aging. We all want to live long lives but more importantly we want to live long and healthy lives. When these cartoons were drawn in a temple in Komombo in Egypt some 5,000 years ago they were the state-of-the-art sophisticated translational research. The cartoon on the left is a birthing stool and the cartoon on the right are a series of instruments which looked like they were designed for building the building but were in fact designed for getting bladder stones out of the bladders of people in ancient Egypt. At that time, the average life expectancy in ancient Egypt was 45 years. And it stayed over the globe on average at 45 years until the beginning of the 19th century. So that uh, despite all of the advances in understanding human health and physiology, it didn't really start to impact on human longevity until about 200 years ago. So that uh, obviously since then things have improved and uh, life expectancy in this country is now estimated to be approximately 82 years, which is a significant improvement. The, Perhaps it's overstating things to say that this is due to the benefits of medical research. The gain over the 19th century and the early part of the 20th century was largely due to two revolutions, not the American and French Revolution, which both happened during that period, but rather the agricultural and industrial revolutions, which delivered good quality food and water for the first time to the majority of the population of the developed world. And so that area that's shown boxed in there was not really medical research. The little bit that came next after that is mostly due to the, uh, well, Howard Florey, antibiotics and vaccines to control infectious diseases. And it's this bit up at the top here 
that we can truly say is due to all the other medical research that's been done. But that, of course, is to belittle the fact that what we've really done is not so much improved longevity over the last few years as improved quality of life, and particularly in the diseases, the chronic diseases that affect us as we get older. It's worth pointing out, of course, that the benefit of that medical research is not uniformly spread across the globe. The countries in sub-Saharan Africa, shown in red and black on that map, still have exactly the same average life expectancy as was true in ancient Egypt some 5,000 years ago. And while we are very fortunate as a dark green country on the map to share with Japan and Canada a very long life expectancy, there are clearly some discrepancies that need to be resolved. Unless we feel complacent that we're doing well in Australia, it's as well to remember that amongst our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander populations, life expectancy at birth is still 17 years less than our average life expectancy. So it's not just a global issue for getting healthcare equality. It's one, even within Australia, that we need to resolve. Another problem that we need to resolve and that we can't ignore is the increasing cost of healthcare because that actually is a challenge which any government will face in the future. The, match, the graph there shows how healthcare is growing at a, co a cost much in excess of the growth of the economy. That's the map for Australia, but the same applies, as you can see from the table, for every country that you look at in the world. The United States leads the way, if lead is the right word, in spending 15% of its GDP on healthcare. But most countries in the world spend about 10%. And that's increased from an average of about 7% some 20 years ago. This increase carries on and is not sustainable. We cannot carry on delivering health care the way we do at the moment and expect that everyone will get equal, equal access to the benefits of it. And one of the challenges that we face is that as we grow older, the cost of in, our health care increases and the benefit to us and to the community decreases. So that we have to think quite carefully about what we're going to do to prevent that becoming a significant problem. This is a sort of facetious remark just to sort of take away from that rather dull economic approach to things. If you go and visit Easter Island, then you will find, the, of course, the, st the statues there that were made famous by Tor Heyerdahl. But you will also find a fungus called rapamycin, which grows uniquely, or at least it used to be uniquely, within, the, within Easter Island. Rapamycin is a very interesting fungus because if the product of it is fed to healthy mid-adult mice, and I regard myself as a healthy mid-adult human, so it's of some relevance to me. It increases their lifespan by approximately 30%. Now that was done first by a group in Na and published in Nature. It has been repeated by two other labs and is consistently true. So that sounds pretty impressive, especially when you realize that you can buy it on Google for not more than about $270 for a dose that would do you for a year. Uh, there is, of course, a snag, and the snag is actually quite a significant one, and it reflects on what we understand about aging. What that drug does is damp down much of the processes that defend you against infection. These inflammatory processes lead to chronic ill health, and they also lead to accelerated aging, so that if you take them away, you'll live longer, but you'll have to do it in a glass bubble in order to keep yourself free of infection, perhaps not a practical solution. I'm going to focus on cancer because cancer happens to be the commonest cause of death in Australia now and worldwide by 2050 UICC, the major cancer, international cancer organisation, believe that it will be true worldwide that cancer becomes the commonest cause of death. As we control infectious disease in the developing world, so cancer will become a major problem for them. It's a disease of ageing. The map there, the graph there basically shows that as you get older, past the age of 50, your chances of getting cancer increase steadily until, interestingly enough, you reach the age of 80. And at the age of 80, your risk of getting cancer in any given year starts to fall. And that's quite an interesting observation. It says that basically there are people who are, if you like, elite survivors. It's true also for your chances of dying from any cause. If you reach the age of 80, then your chances of dying in any week start to fall and get progressively less as you get older. Unfortunately, it doesn't mean you'll live forever if you get past the age of 80. It would be nice if you did. 
But the reality is that there are a group of people who are genetically pro uh, programmed, if you like, to live a long time. Unless you feel that that's something that's unique to humans, I have to say that exactly the same story applies for fruit fly. If they get past the age of 270 days, then their ability to die in the next day continues to fall steadily day by day. So it's a thing that's observed across all of, uh, the, the, of sentient life, if you like. The reality is that there are some people that are elite survivors. Uh, we have the nice knowledge now that with some effort we can prevent over 70% of cancer, a theme I'll come back to in a moment. And perhaps as a good news story, what's happened over the last 30 years is that the chances of you surviving cancer have gone from about 20% when I was a medical student to nearly 55% today. We have made significant inroads on the ability to control cancer. What determines whether we develop cancer? Well, the first thing is that there is a small genetic component. Maybe 10% of your risk of getting cancer comes from the, the, you, what you inherit from your parents. So clearly the message is that you should inherit your parents well. Um, I have been, had the good fortune to have parents that uh, have in fact uh, lived to a healthy old age. My father is now 91 and my mother 85. Uh, but perhaps more significantly, my mother has had three bouts of cancer in her lifetime, each of which in turn have been cured. And that's a reality which would not have been the case when my grandmother was alive, because she died at the age of 40 of cancer. So that in fact, the, the risk of cancer, even if, you inherit, if your genes predispose you to it, can be managed conventionally. But most of the risk that we have for getting cancer comes from what we do to ourselves. It comes from our environment, it comes from the things we do, like the little gentleman in the picture there, uh, it comes from the fact that we can uh, do things to our environment which increase our risk of cancer. There are things like, for example, diesel particulates in the air as a result of uh, uh, the internal combustion engine. Things like arsenic in the drinking water in most of the central part of Asia, which can significantly increase your risk of a whole range of cancers. And then there are the things that we catch from the environment. And I'm talking now about viruses particularly. And that's where I'm going to focus most of the rest of the talk. But before I get on to that, I will just talk a little bit about what we should all be doing to reduce our risk of cancer, because it would be inappropriate to give a public lecture on cancer and not mention these. We read daily in the newspapers about things that increase our risk of developing cancer. We read on page one in the paper that co coffee will increase your risk of getting pancreatic cancer, and on page five of the same newspaper that will decrease your risk of getting other cancers. We send out very confusing messages to the general public, to ourselves, about what we should do to reduce our risk of cancer. A bit like this cartoon in a, in a uh, park in, China, in Russia that I visited about six years ago, where they tell you what you can't do in the park. Uh, some of it's pretty obvious. This guy, up at the, one up at the top here, is obviously about dancing. That's fair enough. And dogs, uh, oh, sorry, we're a bit sensitive here. This, hmm. This one here is a little more confusing, the one with the car and the bicycle. I'm not quite sure what that means, and some of the ones further down get even more puzzling. The one I kind of like is the second one down on the right, because that's actually targeted at the Australian market. It tells you you shouldn't keep your red wine too close to the barbecue. <laughs> uh, uh, but uh, but uh, we need to get clearer messages out about what we need to do to look after our health, and particularly to reduce our risk of cancer. So I will give you the four messages that you need to know. One is you do not smoke. That's clear, it's not good for you. About 40% of avoidable cancer is due to smoking globally. In this country, it, smoking, and not just the cancer caused by smoking, but all the other diseases caused by smoking, cost the population of this country $31 billion every year and 15,000 avoidable deaths. Now, these are not my figures. They come from the Australian Institute of Health and Welfare and therefore a reasonably reliable source. Obesity is the next thing we need to do to avoid cancer. Control obesity and you can get rid of about 10% of avoidable cancer. Cost of obesity to the nation, about $21 billion every year in healthcare costs and about 5,600 avoidable deaths. Alcohol, unfortunately, also on the list. I like a drink of wine like anybody else, but alcohol is a carcinogen, and about 10% of avoidable cancers can be related to alcohol consumption. Total cost of alcohol-related diseases to the community, about $15 billion, 3,200 avoidable deaths. 
Sun exposure is a kind of localised problem, certainly to Australia and to some parts of Europe, if your skin colour is the right colour. Uh, in Scotland, it's not much of a problem, I can tell you. Uh, you have to wait a long time for the sun to shine and burn your skin there. But for people like myself who come from Scotland to Australia, we of course are at very high risk. And it's not a matter of whether you get skin cancer, it's a matter of when you get your first one. Uh, total cost of skin cancer management, mostly the common squamous skin cancer, not the nasty melanoma cancer, is about $10 billion a year in this country and about 3,600 avoidable deaths from, skin, from skin, uh, sun exposure and skin cancer. If you add all of that up, you'll find that half of all our healthcare expenditure in this country is incurred as a consequence of things that we do to ourselves. And when we wonder whether we can actually afford to continue health care at the rate we're doing, we just have to remember that a large part of the solution of that problem lies in our own hands. Speaking as a medical researcher, I could look at it the other way around and say that if that money were to put devoid, depl deployed in medical research, then the benefits to this country in terms of, ex of health care and better health outcomes would be very significant and it would be nice to see some of that money directed in that direction. Anyway, I'm going to talk about the virus story in cancer now. And it's worth pointing out that globally about one in every five cancers is caused as a result of an infection. And I've listed out the different infections there and I'm going to talk about one particularly, the one at the top there, papillomavirus, which is responsible for uh, cervical cancer and a number of other cancers in the genital tract and particularly cancer inside the mouth, as at least one very famous film star was found to admit publicly quite recently uh, uh, and uh, had to then withdraw it when his publicist said it was inappropriate that he admitted how he had caught the virus. Uh, but uh, the reality is that we have all these viruses and indeed some non-viral infections that are responsible for a considerable part of the cancer burden. They all have in common one thing, and that is the vast majority of people who get these infections do not get any problem from them at all. It's a small subset of the people that become infected that get into trouble, and particularly for those who become persistently infected with these viruses that are responsible for cancer, that's when the risk starts to arise. Many of the infections are asymptomatic. We don't know we have them, but they're nevertheless significant in terms of initiating cancer. We have vaccines against two of them now, one against papillomavirus, one against hepatitis B virus. And if we could deploy those vaccines successfully worldwide, then we could reduce by 10% the global cancer burden, which would be quite a significant outcome. So cancer is a disease of the developed world. The country is in red in the map of the countries with the highest cancer burden globally. And that's because we live long enough in those countries to develop cancer. However, cervical cancer, the cancer I'm particularly interested in, is a, is a disease of the developing world. The country's in red on the second map, the one on the right. The reason for that is that ca cervical cancer is one of the two cancers which commonly occur in people under the age of 50. The other one is breast cancer. So breast and cervix cancer, both cancers of women, are the two cancers which are responsible for the cancer burden that we currently see in the developing world. This is just a short aside. It's historic, it's true, and it makes a point, but it has some interesting features to it too. When people started looking at the epidemiology of cancer some 150 years ago, basically cancer at that time was a new concept. People had seen cancer, but they hadn't realized what it was, which is basically cells gone wrong in your body that go to places they shouldn't and have the potential to spread to places where they can kill you. So that he, the, there was a great interest in who got cancer. And an Ita Italian mathematician decided that he would do some work on who got cancer and who didn't. And rep he reported it, as said there, to a meeting of sci Italian scientists in the early 19th century. Uh, he made an observation, which is probably was correct in those days, that cancer were more frequent in nuns than in other women at a ratio of about five to one. Now, only in Italy in the 19th century could you divide the female population into nuns and other women. But uh, it was true because 20% of the female population of Italy in 1850 were nuns. I mean, that was what you did with your second, third, and fourth daughters if you couldn't marry them off. They went into the nunneries because otherwise they starved. Uh, but the reality was, that he made this observation that the frequency of cancer of the uterus, which we would now call cervical cancer, was inversely related to cancers of the breast. In other words, the nuns got breast cancer and the other woman got cervical cancer. 
That was a correct observation. If he'd stopped at that point, that would have been fine. But he went on, and he decided he would speculate as to why that might be. Today, we would call that hypothesize. It sounds better. But uh, he speculated that uterine cancer was not due to licentious practice of women. It was rather greater amongst women who were excessively sensitive, morally, and nervously irritable. Uh, my, like my wife gets when I have to go and give lectures out of town in the evening. Uh, uh, he didn't do any better with the breast cancer. He thought that might be due to the fact that the nun's habits were too tight or the position that they uh, adopted saying prayers might be responsible. Now, it's kind of, you know, but that now seems ridiculous, but there's an interesting point to make from those two observations. The second one, that one, is testable. It's a hypothesis that you could actually do an experiment to test. The first one, I don't think you can test sure how you could go about making women nervous and irritable. Well, maybe I do, but I don't, but I don't think we'd want to do it. Science moves forward because of testable hypothesis. I'm not suggesting you should test that hypothesis. I think we would regard it as an unnecessary these days. But the important point was that if you start with a hypothesis and can test it, that's how we move science forward. This gentleman here came up with some very important hypotheses regarding how the immune system works. And one of those related to the immune system's role in protecting us against cancer. So McFarlane Burnett, of course, is one of the preeminent immunologists worldwide of the 20th century, again an Australian, and somebody who contributed in fields as wide-ranging as flu vaccines and how the immune system fight cancers. He made some hypotheses. He would have called them dogma, but he, he hypothesized that our body's defenses against infection, one of the, its roles is to protect us against developing cancer, which he saw as being different from our normal cells, just like a virus is different from our normal cells. That, I think, we would now accept as true. He went on to speculate that tumors, cancers, have antigens, something which is not self about them, which is different from us. And we now recognize that viruses can cause cancer and that the viral antigens can be different from us. But we also recognize that tumors have other things which make them different from us that the immune system can see. And we can recognize these in the blood of some tumor patients as antibodies, as the sign that the immune system is switched on and recognize that the tumor is not part of us. The problem, of course, is that that is not being sufficient for the cancer to be controlled. Although it's interesting to note that many cancers become more common when our immune system is switched off with drugs. And interesting, more, more interesting still to note that the, most of those cancers that come more common when we switch off the immune system with drugs are cancers which are caused by virus infections, but such as the ones I'm going to talk about today. The basic hypothesis that remains not entirely proven is that the immune system fails to protect us against cancer because our body doesn't really recognize properly that these cancers are different from us. It recognizes that they're different, but not in the right way. And I think that that now also is accepted as true, and we're learning why that might be. I won't have time to talk about that too much today, except to say that we are now living in an era where there are not one, but three drugs available that can be given to patients who have cancer that basically exploit the fact that our immune system sees cancer the wrong way and changes the way that the cancer is seen to one that the immune system, the body's defenses, can see. These drugs are not yet available within Australia, but they will be within the next year. They will make a very significant difference to the management of some cancers. But I'm going to focus rather on viral antigens and how the immune system can be used to protect us against cancer. So this rather complex picture is actually a way of introducing you to the idea that the virus I'm interested in, papillomavirus, is not one virus. It's actually many different types of virus. Every line on that picture represents a different papillomavirus. Now, some of those papillomaviruses cause warts, which you get on your hands and your feet. They don't turn into cancers. Some of them cause warts on your genital tract, and they don't turn into cancers either. But some of them cause cancers in the genital tract. So just to make that a little more simple, the ones that are ringed round in green there, and there are about 10 or 15 of them, are responsible for cervical cancers. 
and the ones that are being run in red are ones which we're very interested in because for most people they don't cause disease but they seem to be able to initiate cancer in the skin another sub subject which I won't have much time to talk about tonight but which is a interesting because skin cancer is the one cancer that becomes really much commoner when your immune system isn't working for which we haven't yet found the virus so we're looking to see if it might be papillomavirus amongst others anyway i'm going to tell you a little bit about the natural history of papillomavirus infection this is a photograph you probably don't have in your family album back home it's a normal human cervix uh, not something you're likely to see it's about a centimeter across that picture if you add papillomavirus to it, this virus which is responsible for cervical cancer, after a little while you get this rather fuzzy looking appearance there. It looks a bit cauliflower like. That's where the virus is copying itself, making lots more viruses. You, if you got that, would never know you had it. It's not a symptom, you don't have any disease, but the virus is busy copying itself. And if you were a woman and had a pap smear done at that point, the pap smear would come back reported as showing evidence of papillomavirus infection. That's a very normal occurrence, and for 98% of people, that's all that ever happens. The virus then goes away, and you're fine. The virus persists on average for one to two years, so there's a fair chance you're going to infect other people during that time. And that's one of the reasons why this virus is very successful, because you, it, you don't know you've got it, and you can easily pass it on. If you're unlucky, somewhere in the middle there, the virus changes the cells a bit, so that they become precancerous. And that's a random event. We don't know why it happens. It's not something that you're particularly genetically prone to. And it's not a different virus that does it. It just happens. And if it persists and goes on for a period of time, then the cervix becomes quite abnormal. You can see that in the top picture on the right there. And the cells that you scrape off it become quite different. And that's an abnormal pap smear that would be reported as precancer and one that would require treatment. Even that lesion can go away on its own and sometimes does but much more commonly it persists and leads over 10 to 20 years to the development of cancer and that obviously is what we want to avoid so we can avoid that by doing pap smears and they are very effective at preventing cervical cancer women who have a pap smear in this country according to the program that's laid down by government a two yearly pap smear over the if you're over the age of 20 there have been no cases of cervical cancer amongst women who have followed that program. We know that because every case of cervical cancer in this country is followed back to see what the pap smear history was. And it's only amongst the women that have had, not had adequate pap smear programs that cervical cancers arise in this country. We also, of course, now have a vaccine to prevent that infection in the first place, about which I'll talk a little more in a moment. And we can develop immunotherapy to try and get rid of this disease that's the precancer lesion. And that's something we've done trials on, but at the moment we don't have an effective immunotherapy, although we've got some clear direction that we might be heading in the right way with that. Controlling infections, once you've got them, is actually very hard. We don't have any vaccines that are designed to control infections. Uh, so this is another way of controlling papillomavirus infection, which I really don't recommend. Uh, unfortunately, 560 people on Facebook actually do recommend it. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I don't want to meet them. Uh, I would much rather prevent infection. It seems a more sensible approach. That's what vaccines are designed to do. So I have to make a disclosure of conflict of interest because I'm going to talk about a vaccine which the University of Queensland and I potentially benefit from financially. Uh, so everything I say about the vaccine, therefore, has to be, you have to treat me as a used car salesman. Uh, I'm not going to actually tell you anything about the vaccine and how it works that has data that I've derived, so the conflict of interest is perhaps more apparent than real. But to distract you from the thought, I'll put up the title that I was given uh, <laughs> during uh, the year I was Australian of the Year. Uh, I think it was probably the vaccine they were talking about, but never mind. I've had to tell my kids that that's not a title they're going to inherit from me. Uh, just in case you think it's all roses, uh, that's the one that Cosmopolitan magazine gave me. Uh, and, uh, uh, and I, I really do hope it was the vaccine they were talking about. Uh, back in 1980, Harold Zerhausen, the gentleman in the picture on the left there, came up with the observation that papillomaviruses were associated with cervical cancer. That 
was a revolutionary discovery. It was the first virus that was associated with a cancer in humans. It had been known for some 60 years before that that viruses could cause cancers in animals, but the idea that they could cause cancer in humans had been dismissed, and in particular, papillomavirus as a cause of cancer had been very specifically dismissed because everybody knew that papillomaviruses caused warts, and warts never turned into cancers. And at that time, we didn't know there were 200 papillomaviruses. It was thought there was just one. Anyway, Harold Zuhausen, quite rightly, was given the Nobel Prize in 2008 for finding that this virus was associated with cancer. Uh, he fulfilled P Peter Doherty's observations that three things had to be right for you to get a Nobel Prize. One, make a significant discovery, and the first virus that causes cancer in humans is a pretty significant discovery. Two, everybody else has to think you're wrong. And uh, the, for Harold Zerhausen, for at least five years, everybody told him he was wrong. That's important because otherwise they'll th claim that they thought of it first, and that makes it difficult to get the Nobel Prize. And the third thing is you have to live a long time because the average time between the time when you make a discovery and your Nobel Prize is 28 years, just exactly what Harold Zerhausen had to wait. At uh, any rate, what he did not know and what we now know is that this is a very common infection, and you probably won't be able to see it, but if you looked at the graph on the left there, what it would tell you is that over the first three years after you become sexually active, 50% of people become infected with the viruses that cause cervical cancer. So one in every two of us likely carry these viruses around at least sometime in our life. But what the graph on the right shows you is that once you've got the virus, over the next five years, 98% of people just get rid of it themselves. They never know they have it. So this is a very common infection. Most of us don't know we've got it. Most of us get rid of it without any problems. But if you're in the 2% that get persisting infection, that's when the risk of cancer arises. So it seems self-evident to us that it was sensible to try and develop a vaccine to help prevent cervical cancer. Now, what we now know is that this is a virus that we cannot grow in the lab. Most viruses we can grow very easily in the lab. We can add the virus to cells in the test tube, but the cells get infected with the virus. More virus comes out than you put in. For, cervical can for the cervical cancer-causing papillomaviruses, nobody has been able to make that work. So we had to use recombinant DNA technology uh, to make these virus-like particles, the little footballs that you can see on the right beside Jan Zhu's photograph. Jan and I came up with this technology back in 1990. Uh, it required a few twi tricks to get that to work. It took about a year. But I won't bore you with the details of it, except to say that it everything we tried failed repeatedly over the course of a year until one day it actually worked. And that we, did, we knew why it had worked when we got it working, but we did not know how to get it to work until we had tried many different things. Uh, the net result of that was the vaccines that we now have, which are very conventional vaccines designed to protect us against infection in exactly the same way as every other vaccine you were given as a, in childhood. That little yellow arrow that connects 1990 with 2005 should possibly be a little bigger, because while it cost us about $100,000 to do the work we did over the year in 1990, it cost the companies about $2 billion to go from that technology to the products that you now have available on the market. That $2 billion allowed scale up of the method of making the stuff. It allowed the clinical trials to be done over 15 years. And it's one of the reasons why these vaccines in this country cost significant amounts of money. The actual cost of manufacturing the goods is about, a, is about $5 a dose. $120 to, so that the companies can get back that $2 billion investment they made. Anyway, we now have two vaccines which essentially do the same job. One of them protects against the two viruses most commonly responsible for cervical cancer, 16 and 18, and these two types are together responsible for about 70% of cervical cancer. The other vaccine protects exactly the same way against exactly the same viruses, but also adds in two more viruses which are responsible for genital warts. Why that's important will become obvious in a moment. When the vaccines were put into clinical trial, they turned out, as shown in the red box there, to be 100% effective at protecting not only against infection, but against the development of that precancer lesion that I told you about had to be treated and that was detected by pap smears. So that this vaccine had, an, the studies showed that the women who were going to get persistent infection were protected not only against infection, but against developing precancer. 
These studies were very large. You can see that over, that over 20,000 women took part in each arm of the trials because it's a rare complication to get the precancer lesion. So very big studies were needed. There are two very important points about these studies. One is they only prevent the development of the precancer if you haven't had the infection. If you've had the infection, even if there are no signs of it, not even an abnormal cell in the cervix, it doesn't protect you against the development of subsequent cancer. They do not get rid of an infection that's already there. And the second point is that they only protect against the two types that are in the vaccine, type 16 and 18. So at the moment, the vaccines that are available very substantially reduce your risk of getting cervical cancer, but they do not absolutely protect you. That's important, because it's important to remember to keep having pap smears. The good news there is that a 10 valent vaccine is now available, gone through clinical trials, will become available hopefully within the next year or two on a global basis, which will give 96% protection against cervical cancer, which effectively will be 100%, and that will reduce the need for the pap smear program in due course. Vaccines have to be safe. Uh, so you have to know what's going on once you're using them. Safe, I mean, most vaccines give you a sore arm, but it's really only when you give large numbers of people the vaccine that you find out whether it's safe in the, uh, for, uh, to, for rare events. So 44 million do doses of the vaccine were given over the first two years after the vaccine became available. And during that time, there were about 12,000 reported adverse events. Now that just means something that happens after vaccination. It doesn't mean it was due to vaccination. It could have been that you were in a motor vehicle accident and you were run down, and that would not have been due to the vaccine, but it would be reported as an adverse event. Most of the common things that looked like they were due to the vaccine were uh, simple things like fainting. In America, they generally, for some reason, believe in vaccinating people standing up. They then faint, fall over, and that's why you have 200 head injuries and six broken noses. Uh, just like people die, it's much easier. But perhaps more significantly, there were a few allergic events, 6, 600 out of 44,000 people, and 28 quite severe allergic events, no deaths, but 28 severe allergic events. That's one in a million, which is about the same as for every other vaccine we currently use. That's about the allergic reaction rate to the currently available vaccines. So it's a safe vaccine. Is it safe in pregnancy? Well, Women that take part in clinical trials are told that they must not get pregnant, they must take all appropriate precautions to make sure they don't, because we don't want anybody exposed to a risk unnecessarily. Of the 12,000 women that took part in the first clinical trial, how many of them got pregnant? Well, answer 1,244. It shows how effective our instructions were. Indeed, there was a rumour going around that the vaccine might cause pregnancy. Uh, uh, so that that's why you have a control group, and the control group did equally well at getting pregnant. So I think it's reasonable to assume it wasn't the vaccine. Uh, but more since, again, more since, seriously, the rate of adverse events in the vaccine group and the placebo group as regards pregnancy outcome were identical, and the serious complications of congenital abnormalities, again, identical between the vaccine and the placebo group. Pregnancies go wrong, but they did not go wrong more often because you had received the vaccine. So while we don't recommend this vaccine in pregnancy, nevertheless, it's not going to cause a problem if you get pregnant having had the vaccine. How well is the vaccine working? The answer is best measured by what's happened to genital warts in this country over the last seven years since we started vaccinating girls routinely in 2006. The interesting thing is that, as you can see here in the blue line, genital warts amongst young women have virtually disappeared. The data show there's a slight decline in the sort of women in the 21 to 30 age group. They also got vaccinated, but not all of them did. And then no change at all in the over 30 year olds who didn't get vaccinated. So genital warts in women have effectively gone away. The interesting thing is genital warts in men have also gone away in the under 21 year olds because they're protected because the women are protected. This is called herd immunity. And it's a really powerful indication of how useful this vaccine is, because with only 70% of women immunized, which is roughly what we achieved, and none of the men, nevertheless, the disease has gone away from men and women of that age. And that's the data to show that the men don't get the problem either. Again, you can see the blue line showing this dramatic decline in genital warts in the men. And as far as cervical cancer is concerned, 
We obviously don't expect to see a change in cervical cancer for a few years yet because cervical cancer takes a long time to develop after you get papillomavirus infection, unlike genital warts. But what really has happened is that the types of virus that are protected against, against the vaccine have disappeared from pap smears. So type 16 and 18, which cause cervical cancer and are protected against by the vaccine, are no longer found in pap smears. The other types, which cause no disease, but are infecting our genital tract anyway, are still there. So the vaccine is working exactly the way we would predict. And again, this is, I'll, look, I'll, I'll pass over that in the interest of time, but what it basically shows is that in the period after we introduced the vaccine, even people who have not been vaccinated are protected against the infection simply because of the herd immunity effect. So the, the risk of you getting these infections has dropped significantly even amongst people who are not vaccinated. So that's half the story, but the other half of the story, the challenge is to get this vaccine where it's really needed worldwide. We would like to get the vaccine out there. It's licensed in most countries in the world, but licensing and delivering are two different things. So we've been doing a project in Vanuatu to show that they can deliver the vaccine there. We provide the vaccine, they go out and deliver it. A challenge for vaccination, no f one fridge for vaccines in the whole country, no reliable electricity. Five doctors, 91 parliamentarians, a very bad ratio that. Do not encourage that ratio. Canberra would be drowning in parliamentarians if we had that ratio. But the shortage of doctors obviously makes it diff difficult to deliver programs there. Uh, and more significantly, we went out and took women randomly walking the streets in Vanuatu and asked them to have a pap smear. One in every hundred had cervical cancer when we looked. And approximately five times that number had precancer that was going to become cancer in their lifetime. So this is a very common disease in Vanuatu. The infection there is, doesn't matter what age you go at, the infection is very common. Vanuatu is different. The developing world is different. In this country, the graph would not look like that. As you get older, the infection would become rare. In the developing world, the infection persists much more commonly. And it doesn't matter what age you are, the instance of the infection in the community is about the same. The risk that it's associated with cancer or precancer, of course, increases with age. And that's the bad news because the people who are persistent infected have a very high chance of developing cancer. So it's a place where vaccination is really needed. The critical bit of getting a vaccine program out there is education. They need to know there's a problem. They need to know why the vaccine is used. They need to know what it does. So we did a lot of education. We went out and talked with the schools. We talked with the parents. We talked with the nurses that went round and looked after the kids. And we talked with the teachers. And after we'd done that, we could introduce a vaccine program. And with that background, we were able to get about 80% of the young women who were of eligible age in the main island in Vanuatu vaccinated just like we achieved in Australia. And more importantly, 93% of them came back to get all three doses, whereas we only managed 86% in Australia. So in Vanuatu, the Vanuatu government can, with the appropriate advice, deliver their own program to help prevent cervical cancer in their country. And that's something that we're now helping them out with by providing vaccine. Bhutan, the same story. It's that little tiny dot on the, on the map up in the top left corner there that's dark. They are a young country, they are a poor country. Cervical cancer, the orange stripe there, is the commonest cause of death in women between the ages of 30 and 50, the commonest cancer in that country. It's a beautiful country, that's the memorial. We went up to look at the Himalayas, which you can see. That's the view of the Himalayas we got. Uh, they're up there somewhere, trust me. But that's a memorial to the third king of Vanuatu, uh, who was the one who defended Vanuatu, sandwiched between China and India, from the assault on both sides that they tried to squeeze him out. Uh, he defended the country and they built that to, to memorize the event. But the king there was much more important than that because it's the royal family that decided that, Vanua, that uh, Bhutan should have vaccination. The royal family, uh, the royal grandmother is the one sandwiched between me and my wife there. She's 84 years old. She decided that her country should be vaccinated against cervical cancer. She invited the Australian Cervical Cancer Foundation in. She arranged that the two ministers that are there in the saffron robes, the health and the education minister, were instructed that they should deliver a vaccine program, and they did. 
We went out there and delivered the, taught them how to do it. The girls are a bit better behaved in, in, in Bhutan than they were in Vanuatu. They wear school uniforms, they line up nicely, but they still look very uncomfortable when you vaccinate them. Uh, we have, this is data just showing how good that Bhutan is at vaccinating. The data on the left is for the common childhood vaccines. The data on the right is for hepatitis B vaccine. One year after they started, every girl in the country had been vaccinated virtually. Papillomavirus, exactly the same, and they've obtained that program now for five years. So we can do it in the developing world. The critical thing is to get the vaccine there. We need to educate even the WHO about cervical cancer and HPV. This is WHO's figures of deaths from infectious diseases globally. And the ones in green are the ones we've got vaccines against, and the ones in red are the ones we'd really like to have vaccines against. But what's missing? Papillomavirus, that's where it belongs. It should be on that list there. It's number eight on the list of deaths due to infection globally, and it's just missed off because it takes 30 years between the time when you get the infection and the time when you get the cancer that kills you. So we need to do something a bit more public about that. And just to put that as a final message to you, home in perspective, compare polio with papillomavirus. Now, poliovirus, when I was a kid, was something that was sufficiently significant that I wasn't allowed to go to swimming pools, I wasn't allowed to go to the cinema when there was an epidemic of polio around because I might catch it and it might cause serious problems for me. It's certainly true that it's a very common infection. Your child getting poliovirus when there was no vaccine and papillomavirus when there was, is no vaccine, about the same, one or two chance in your lifetime. The lifetime risk of serious disease if you got the virus for polio was about 1%, 1% chance that you'd get paralytic polio that would be clinically recognizable. 2% chance that you'll get cervical cancer if you get the papillomavirus. Lifetime risk of death, 0.1% for polio, 0.8% for cervical cancer, eight times more likely to do it. And just to put that in perspective, in 1952, which was the worst year for polio in the United States before the vaccine was introduced, there was an epidemic which killed 3,100 people and left 22,000 approximately paralyzed. In 2005 in the United States, when there was a perfectly good pap smear program for preventing cervical cancer, Nevertheless, there were nearly 4,000 deaths from cervical cancer and 12,000 diagnosed with cervical cancer. So even in the face of a pap smear program, cervical cancer was a bigger problem than polio was at the worst of the epidemic. And of course, the vaccines are equally efficacious, equally safe. If anything, the polio vaccine is slightly less safe than the papillomavirus one. So it seems to me self-evident that we should be doing a global eradication program for papillomavirus at the same time as we're doing it for poliovirus. It's just as bad a disease and it's just as much needed. And with that thought, I'll just stop and thank you very much for your attention, point out that the work that I've done and described here has been done by many of my colleagues both here and in the United States and has been funded by all of the various funding agencies listed out there. And I've pointed out also that while they're doing all the work, I'm usually up skiing somewhere and you can see the tracks there that I made uh, as I was coming down the hill. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank, you for, thank you, Professor Fraser, for giving me quite a stunning talk on the journey. It's something to behold, really. We have the time for some questions, and I've got one roving mic, so can we put the hands up if people would like to ask a question, and I'll get our children to walk around. Yeah, the, that's a, a very important question to which we would like to get a really good answer. Unfortunately, the one trial that was going to be done globally to answer that question was going to be done in India. And unfor even more unfortunately, there was a political scandal in India which stopped that tra trial dead in its tracks as a consequence of the Communist Party there deciding that they were going to blame suicidal deaths in young women on the vaccine uh, with no evidence, I might add. Uh, so the one study that could properly answer that question was not done. Having said that, there are quite a number of women who have taken part in the big 
trials who only got two doses and of course they are being followed in the same way as the woman that got three and as yet there has been no increase in cervical cancer or pre-cancer or even infection in the woman that only had two doses. So it looks like at the moment that the vaccine will work and protect you if you only have two doses. What we do not know is how long the protection will last. At the moment we know it's at least seven years but there's a big difference between seven years and a lifetime. Yes, okay, that's an area which I have some direct experience on, Chris. Uh, the, uh, I mentioned that I thought that papillomavirus might be triggering skin cancer, and we know that papillomaviruses can be isolated from skin cancer in people who have got a damaged immune system. Of course, that doesn't prove that the virus causes the skin cancer, it just says it can grow in the skin cancer of an immunosuppressed patient. We have looked very closely at precancer lesions, the, what's called sunspots by some people, and uh, solar keratosis, sometimes actinic keratosis. These are precancer lesions for squamous cancer. We've looked very closely at these using what is a very sophisticated and powerful technique. And out of 25 such lesions, we only found one that had any papillomavirus in it, and it was a lesion with a virus which I do not think is likely to have triggered anything to do with the lesion. It was a rare type of papillomavirus, which we think is benign. So I don't think there's direct evidence, but, and there's always a but, and scientists love buts. I mean, it gives us an excuse to carry on doing the work we want to do. The, uh, the but is this. In cattle, papillomavirus causes cancer in the gullet. That's unequivocally true and you need a cofactor, something else. In Scotland, it's bracken fern. Now, you wouldn't like eating bracken fern, and nor do the cattle, but if there's nothing else, that's what they eat. And if they eat the bracken fern and have the papillomavirus infection, then they get esophageal cancer. You can prove that because you can isolate them so they never see the virus and give them the bracken fern and they never get the cancers. Or you can give them the virus but don't let them eat the bracken and they never get the cancers. But the really interesting thing is, that while you can find the virus round about the cancers in the gullet, you never find the, the virus in the cancer. In other words, it's a hit and run virus. It comes along and sets the scene up, but it doesn't need to hang around when the cancer develops. So if we go looking in the cancer lesions as we've been doing and you don't find a virus, that does not prove that there wasn't a virus that triggered it off. So now we're going back and trying to work out a little bit further back along the history of the disease to see if there's a possibility that a virus might have been involved. We're looking for fingerprints, if you like, that the virus has been there. And uh, that's early days work, but it looks like there's some suggestion that there may be some virus going on there. So we need to know a bit more about that before I can answer your question, but the story is not yet finished. Well, the good news is there's not another reservoir. Uh, uh, it's basically a human virus. It only infects humans. Uh, and that makes it, at least in principle, possible to eliminate it. The even better news is that we obviously don't need to immunize very many people in the community to significantly reduce the risk of spread. What that really means is that, unlike measles, where one person can infect 100 people, this virus, when you get it, you probably only infect one or two and therefore the risk is diminished if there's some people out there immunized, but you don't need everybody to be immunized. The real problem is the same one as we're having with polio, and that is to really get rid of it, to say it's gone, you have to get every last case. And since most people that get the virus have no knowledge that they've got it, just as with polio, it's quite possible for you to have quite a large reservoir of infected people and they can infect others who get the disease, but you just don't know they're there because they don't, they don't tell you, they don't know they've got the disease. I think if we got the immunization rate up to about 70, 80% in boys and girls in this country and kept it up at that level, 
the data we have at the moment suggests very strongly the virus would go. Genital warts in this country, if you develop them under the age of 30, people will ask you where you were on holiday, which overseas country you went to, because you almost certainly caught the disease overseas. So that we've got to make sure globally that we get rid of the viruses as well. But I think in principle, this is one where we might actually achieve that, but it's going to take a, a few years to do. Yeah, look, first of all, the vast majority of papillomaviruses we don't need to worry about. If I go around and pluck eyebrow hairs out of you at random, I'll find five different papillomaviruses on the end of every one of the eyebrow hairs I pluck out, and they're never going to cause you any problems. So we're only really worried about the papillomaviruses which are responsible for cancer. And what we know about them is that there is some evidence of what's called cross-protection against strain types which are not in the vaccine, but it's not strong so that the, these viruses, they get different numbers because they're immunologically distinct from each other and therefore the immune response against one is not very effective against the other types. That's why we need the 10-valent vaccine because that will basically cover all the types that are responsible for cervical cancer that we know about and I think we've probably found all that are really responsible. The, uh, the real issue is how long you get protection if it's cross protection you know it's not it's not enough to say well there's a little bit of cross protection you really need to be sure it's going to work which is why we need to re recommend people carrying on with pap smears at the moment but with the 10 valent vaccine i think that will not be an issue i think we'll get rid of the viruses that are responsible for cervical cancer and also the mouth cancers and also the other genital cancers and the the disease will effectively disappear but we need to get that 10 valent vaccine out there Hi, really nice presentation. Hi. Um, I was just wondering um, whether, obviously, the three doses that you give of the, the vaccine, is that going to be worth a lifetime's protection, or will a uh, booster shot be required later in life, particularly as the immune system starts to deteriorate somewhat and you might need a booster? Well, I'll tell you in a lifetime. <laughs> but seriously, the real risk of you getting these viruses is within the first five years after you become sexually active on average. So of course if you get vaccinated at 12 and you start your sexual uh, career at the age of 75 then you're going to be at risk at that time and therefore you would want to know that you're protected. Uh, the, we can't answer that question. Most vaccines that we give believe, we believe give lifelong protection but some don't. I mean, the measles vaccine is the classic example of one which does not give lifelong protection. If we're going back to get second shots is a good idea. Another one is for uh, the whooping cough bacteria, where again, protection is not lifelong. And going back to get booster shots is a good idea, if not to protect yourself, at least to protect your children and grandchildren. Uh, so we'll have to wait and see. But the nice part of the story is that because we're carrying on the pap smear programs we have an early warning system we will know if immunity fails because women will start turning up with abnormal pap smears who have been vaccinated and that's why it's so important that we actually have a vaccine registry in this country that matches up with the cervical cancer screening registry they do that in, in uh, Scandinavia we have not yet persuaded our government that it's a good idea to do it in Australia and yet it would seem like a pretty good idea to me to actually spend the little bit of money that's necessary to do that. The reason it's not being done in Australia is because the cervical cancer screening registries are owned by the states and the vaccine registry is owned by the federal government and states and federal government are not allowed to talk to each other. Gentleman in the middle down here. Firstly, <coughs> firstly thank you very much for a, a really outstanding presentation. My uh, question is that I have heard from someone who's prone to conspiracy theories. Oh dear. <laughs> the problem is that they tend to occasionally arise uh, in the popular press. 
that the HPV vaccine has caused sterility in a number of young women, and this is the reason why the Japanese government is no longer uh, recommending it. And I was wondering what you could uh, tell us about that to Scottish improvement before they get too much advanced. Well, one of the obvious answers is the data that I showed you on the slide there, where 1,200 women out of 12,000 managed to get pregnant while they were having the vaccine. So I don't think it's a very effective means of contraception, if that's what the answer is. Uh, the, but more seriously, first of all, the va Japanese government have not, not recommended the vaccine. They've just removed it from the list of vaccines that they are putting about as mandatory. They still, it's still an endorsed vaccine for use in Japan. But, so there's, they haven't raised a safety issue against it. What they've said is they want more data. The data that they do have is pretty thin. I've looked at it, there's not a lot in it at the moment. Nothing to suggest really that there's an issue of sterility. Uh, there are one or two people that have developed autoimmune ovarian disease as a res and have been vaccinated previously. But one of the problems is that these autoimmune ovarian diseases do occur in young women whether you're vaccinated or not. And what we don't have is a good registry in this country or in any other country of the actual frequency of these rare diseases that people are now attributing to whatever, you know, be it uh, uh, too much, drinking too much Coca-Cola or a vaccine or lifestyle. We, you know, this is where population-based registries of disease, where our electronic medical record would make a significant difference to our ability to scotch these rumours, or alternatively, if there is substance to them, to find it out. We, without those data sets, we really just don't know. But if you ask me whether I think there is any probability that the vaccine could be responsible for sterility, the answer is no. I see no medical reason, no scientific reason why that would be likely to be the case. Given that this is a vaccine which is in principle exactly the equivalent of the hepatitis B vaccine, which we've been using globally for 30 years, and where there is no evidence that it's causing any disease of that nature. So I, I think it's just scaremongering, and unfortunately, scaremongering occurs. I think we'll, we'll call that the questions to a halt. Can we put our hands together for this?